mostly the, the first part is stuff you already know. The second part is stuff that um, uh, might get you uh, a little bit interested in. You might not know about all of these things. And then the third part is hopefully a little controversial. Um, so to start, um, the talking about service and service basics, and, the, and primarily I wanted to start with this because I think I have a slightly quirky uh, set of definitions, um, but this one I can attribute to my pal, very good, um, the U2, E2, 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 which is thinking about um, experiences that are both useful and usable, um, efficient, effective, desirable, and differentiated, but both from the providers and the person's point of view. And the reason that this is in, important in terms of um, looking at this is that um, uh, you really could break down a service into three components. Uh, the, the people who are interacting via touch points, the service providers who are deciding what to provide, and then the service medium, what we and the service providers <coughs> decide to provide together. So, what's really going on here is um, uh, that, and again, this is my sort of quirky way of talking about this, I really think that people, when they're interacting with touch points, are actually designing. So they're designing the service. The only thing that we're doing is we're providing the resources for them to be able to do this. So I always have big issues with people who say we're designing the experience. No, we can't do that. People have experiences. We design resources for them to be able to enact those things. So that's what this is all about. And if you think about that, the relationship between the person and the provider is actually the brand relationship. And all of that stuff builds up over time um, through interacting with many touch points. So services really come to life by how people read those resources and through their personal history and context. So this is where I come to this um, uh, notion. It's really from Berg Simon and the Sciences of the Artificial, uh, where he says that everyone designs, who devises a course of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. So that's why I believe the people <coughs> interacting and engaging in the service are actually designing, and we're doing meta design. So let's look at a really funny example. So I went trolling um, online to see if I could find some interesting images for um, illustrating this. And I found this bank in Poland. Now I don't know these people who designed it. Um, I don't know this bank in particular, but this is the before picture. But look at this. You can see the, the people who are trying to interact with the service. You can see the service medium. Everything from this funny red thing by the door, but you can't figure out what that is to these horrible barriers between you and the people, um, even to the really awful chair that we're expecting the, the, uh, the person, the user, to uh, actually use. And the service providers are sort of hard to distinguish, or they're behind really kind of strange barriers. So, oops. Um, now we have the same provider with a new service medium. So these are the people who actually designed it. Um, uh, it's the ING Bank, and I can't pronounce it, Poland, um, and the summer credit is there. But think about the difference in the service experience there. What's being offered for the people, um, so what they have is, a, you know, this is ING, so they have a cafe. They're really making the service experience about the people who are going there and trying to remove as many barriers as possible. If you look over on the far right, you see that there's these new interaction stations for working with uh, the people in the bank. The middle one is the cafe, where you can do um, personal transactions and have a coffee. Um, but of course, these were architects who took the photos, so there's no people in them at all. <laughs> um, so here's a different, oops, I keep doing the wrong thing here. Um, a different bank and new service media. So what's really changed for us over time is that now we have a situation where we have, we've gone from one setting where we had our, our financial transactions to actually any setting. We go from known languages for ba banking. My parents used to, they knew what to do when they went into the bank. They had a conversation with a person. And what we've done is we really introduced new languages for banking. Here's a, 
Another example um, uh, that's from um, the Bank of America. Happens to be my bank. Um, but what's interesting about this is that they taught us how to do all of these things anew. So everything from looking up what I, you know, what my account is, to um, making uh, transfers between accounts, to God forbid, it, no one ever dreams of this. When I was working on an ATM interface back in the uh, early '90s, you know, we said, "Oh gosh, wouldn't it be great if eventually it could spit out the money, you know, at home?" And well, hmm. so now we can actually deposit the money any place we are. So everybody. No one thought that that was going to be possible, but now we've taught people to do that. So the interesting thing for me is the one in the end. So now, when I go to my bank, they're offering me deals. So what is that about? What language, what new kind of transaction are they trying to teach me about? So I think it's really interesting. Anyway. So as I said, I really believe that service designers are meta designers. We're designing for experience, not designing the experience. And we give people the resources so that they can bring the experience to life for themselves. We create those affordances that Jane mentioned um, that help people know where to start, what to do, and when, both physically and digitally. So now I get to the point where it's like, wow, yikes. Does yikes translate into other <laughs> Dorga said, what does that mean? <laughs> it's kind of like, oh my goodness. Um, so if we're trying to create the right resources for anyone, anywhere, no matter what their context and their personal history, this is kind of a big challenge. All right, but that's hard enough, but there's actually other things going on that even makes it more challenging for us as these meta designers. So there's two trends that I think are really important. Um, in the near term. There's one uh, that we call living. Things about mobile and central uh, sensors and natural. Um, the rate of mobile adoption is just phenomenal. I think we all know that. We've talked about it already today. Um, I like this. Uh, they look pretty bad. So sorry. Uh, the translation of the PDF wasn't happy. Um, the percent of U.S. adults who own a smartphone is, uh, as of September was uh, 45%. Um, a billion smartphones uh, will be sold in 2014, things that you're seeing on the right-hand side. It is just uh, really pretty phenomenal. And the kind of capabilities that we now have in um, things like our iPhone that we never, ever imagined walking around with. Um, you know, I think the, the mo one of the most interesting things, of course, is um, <coughs> introduction of Surrey. Um, but when we have this walking around information and these overlays that these new kinds of devices can offer us, um, how are service providers going to go back to doing <coughs> what Ferguson said is really important? Um, this differentiation and desirability, when you can't control that anymore. Because you might not even get someone in your door because of what they see long before in this kind of attraction mode now. Um, and these are three, three examples. And these are real. Um, I still, this is still my all-time favorite example of, of um, ubiquitous sensors. Um, everybody thought it was creepy, I thought it was fabulous. You know, Tom Cruise walking into the gap with somebody else's eyes and it remembering what he purchased the last time. That was really, I think, very uh, prescient. Let's see another one. But we have these sensors now at home with things like the NAS thermostat. We have them on the go with a Nike fuel band. We have touch. You guys, anybody who was here last year saw these first two examples about how children now are perceiving iPads in a totally different way. So the image on the left is the baby interacting with the iPad. The image in the middle is the same child trying to interact in the same way with um, the magazine. I heard a story the other day uh, about someone who was having a Skype call with their grandmother, the child was having a Skype call with the grandmother, and the grandmother went uh, away uh, to go get a cup of tea, and the child was trying to swipe the grandmother <laughs> back into the picture. So it's really, really fascinating what all of these things are doing to us. And I have to say that I absolutely love, um, from a touch kind of interaction, this uh, the pillow that comes with uh, Windows 8 and the Nokia phone. Um, 
Um, I, I mentioned voice and Surrey. I think everybody knows about that. I think it's really, really powerful and getting better. Um, but I think that what we're really looking forward to is more like this image in Minority Report, which is really looking at this instrumentality. We're going to learn how to play with our spaces and our information in the same way that uh, people long before us uh, learned to play instruments, like a flute or a clarinet or these other kinds of things. I think there's going to be these attitudes towards interacting with this notion of instrumentality. Um, so there's uh, Mary Meeker. How many of you know about Mary Meeker's report? Anybody who hasn't seen it, I would suggest you go and download it. It's really interesting because she has really um, wonderful data that she publishes every year about the trends. And um, one of the things that was the first time ever that I think we can be encouraged about was she said that um, nearly everything was going to be reimagined, powered by new devices, connectivity, user experience, and beauty. So here's some of the things that she talked about, transportation, entertainment, personal services. This is an image from the New York Times, the way we used to get a cab, and the way that I always go to the airport in San Francisco, where I have my virtual thumb stuck out, and the car comes to me. Um, uh, there were many more in her set, but four that I thought were also really interesting to call out were the reimagination of education, financial services, health care, and government. And at the Services Science Management and Engineering Design Conference that was held in uh, San Francisco in, I think it was July, uh, Jim Sporer talked about those as the four big challenge areas for service science going forward. That's me in old-fashioned teaching. And the new way in the modern cafe. The second thing, the second trend that I think is really important to pay attention to is this notion of um, intention. So, Doc Searles wrote this book, and again, it's kind of controversial, but I think it's really, really interesting to think about this. Um, what he talked about was, he wrote this article called The Customer is God, and uh, the summary is a, it's a revolution in personal empowerment, and mine will never be the same. So, in the article, he tells a story about um, uh, a woman who's in her kitchen, and it's 3 o'clock, and she's preparing for uh, a party that evening. Her espresso machine is broken. So what does she do? She picks up her device. <coughs> she looks at the back of the device, where there's a, a, a code sensor. She um, takes an image of that sensor and puts it out to the web with her intent that she has a party starting at 6 and she needs a replacement or a uh, rental in that time. So then magic happens. All of this information goes out and lo and behold, through a metamediary, um, she gets a response back that there's a machine on its way. It's actually going to be just a replacement that will pick up her old machine and repair it for her and bring it back. <coughs> so that's the intention economy, and that's doing an intent test. So he says that there's a couple of things that we need to be thinking about, that um, there's some flaws. Right now, online, we're different people everywhere we go, right? So I have a different uh, persona at, or a profile at Amazon <coughs> than I do at Facebook, than I do at LinkedIn versus whatever. So what's um, uh, the problem with that is that when you want to make a shift, um, which person are you in terms of having this conversation? So he thinks that that's a big issue, that we have all of these um, separate relationships. I can tell you that, having worked at Facebook, that um, uh, Facebook would really love to have uh, Facebook Connect be that way of representing your profile everywhere. The fiction that Doc Searle says 
is that personalization will come with big data. He thinks that there's some issues around that, that we don't know exactly how to um, actually interact with big data in the most effective way. And so he says that the personalization isn't going to happen, but I disagree. Um, but he does say that he thinks that we will own our own profiles and our own sensor, sensor database. So think about this. What's really going to happen is that your shoes are going to know when it's time to go and have new uh, heels put on. You know, your clothes are going to know how often you wore them. Your clothes are going to tell you, oop, you know, you're going with someone that you wore that with last time, so you want to make sure that you wear something different. <laughs> Um, so there's all of this sense that we're going to have data about what we ate, where we went, uh, who we were with, um, how our body has reacted to all of that from all of these different devices all over the place. So I think there's some really interesting challenges associated with that, one of which is I think that um, uh, we aren't literate in how to read data. We don't teach our kids in school to read data in the same way we teach them to read and write. So I think that that's going to be one of the challenges about this. So here's my three questions. Um, in a living service world, we have these new questions for both service providers and service designers. Who's going to be the broker? Okay, so what happened in the sort of scenario about the espresso machine is that there was a broker between the woman who needed the machine and the rest of the world. Who's going to be that broker? If we think that services um, are going to be brokered and you'll intend to catch every need, who are the right people? You know, there are lots of um, companies out there thinking that they should be the ones to do this for you. Everything from your, um, your device makers, my iPhone, Android, the Windows phone, the Nokia, um, the uh, banks, Citibank, your bank, who owns this? Amazon, Facebook, or even Reputation.com. It's a company that was designed, uh, conceived, to actually help people think about managing these things. So what I have here as an example is Amazon subscribe and save. Does anybody know what that is? So what's really great about this uh, service is that for mundane things that I don't want to think about anymore, so I make yogurt every week. And finding the right yogurt starter is really a pain. So I subscribe to yogurt starter from Amazon. So it comes to me at regular intervals. It asks me before they decide to send it, but it comes to me. I don't even have to think about it anymore. I don't have to worry about Yogurt starter. So it's really interesting to think about these things coming to us. I mean, I think it's a really good example of a precursor of this um, um, a broker. Amazon would be very happy to be our broker for everything, just like they do. So which service brands and service models do you need to cooperate, integrate, to provide the resources for comprehensive service experience? So um, back in July at the SSME conference in San Francisco, Bob Blushko presented a service. I'm actually sort of standing at his shoulders in the example I'm going to show you in a little bit. But he was saying, so you have all of these different components. You have the hotels, and you have some um, travel sites that already integrate these things, hotel and flight. Um, what if you, you know, and car and all of that. What if you really sort of thought about the trip in a, in a different way? you really thought about it holistically. So he has an example where you can sort of end working, where you can um, modify design. But I think that there will be something called whole service cooperatives, where brands will get together and decide to cooperate to deliver a specific kind of service experience. I think that you know some retail experiences, travel, absolutely, um, some things in education, financial services. I think these all happen. What's an appropriate human-centered service programming language to make it all transparent? Because remember I said the, we, the, the people are actually going to be designing the services themselves. So this is, a, I think, a really nice example. Um, it's called
called IFTTT. And it's, um, you can go there, IFTTT.com. And you can see how people have put recipes together to do things that they want to do. And this is an old idea. Um, it's been around for a long time. But I think, again, if you start to think about these things from all of these different directions, we have some really nice opportunities. So, I am on a fabulous trip um, where I started out um, uh, in the States, and I'm going to be visiting a lot of the Fjord offices, but I started off in London. So if I was thinking about, I got home, and I'm going to do my trip to London again, so what, what happens there? So I say to, I could say it to my device, um, I could say it to some sensors in my environment, I could just walk in and there could be some really wonderful little beautiful sensor balls in a beautiful uh, bowl next to my doorway when I walk in and I can turn it on or leave it off. Think about that. Um, I say I'm off to London. Uh, then the service, actually my trusted service mediator, comes back and says, got it Shelley, you're going off to London again. Um, and based on my past trips, my trusted service uh, mediator requests access to a variety, a variety of my data slices. Things like my airlines, my preferred airlines, so that's the data cluster that I've um, specified. My Foursquare history, my calendar, my contacts. Think about these as sort of de separate data slices that I now control. So I have the control. It comes back to me and says, I need these to be able to do it. And of course, there's some negotiation going on where I say yes to this one or no to that one if I really want to have that kind of control over my own data. And then um, the, it notifies me that the trip is done. Um, and of course, this is a what we used to call it Xerox way, way, way back when it was called an um, SMP. A small matter of programming. Um, but so there are magic algorithms working in the background. But I really, really don't think this is that far fetched. And then when it comes back to me, tiles represent the trip recipe, other services, and people that I'm likely to include in my selected um, service providers. And all of those people who I've included and selected now have a backstage notification that I'm going to be coming, and they can enhance their relationship with me. So what's going on here is, uh, like I said, it's the starting with this intent, um, inferencing, data gathering, negotiation, delivery, and um, the recipes visualized. But the living piece, it's really all of those things that I showed you early on. It could be anywhere in the environment. I could be on the street with sensors, apparently from this movie, in the step one. Um, but you can imagine being able to control through the sensor environment and the kinds of communication through voice or gesture or whatever your intent. Um, I cast a wish to a trusted service mediary. I really wonder how I'm going to choose which mediary that is. Is it going to work if I have multiple mediary? How is this going to, you know, who are the appropriate sources that I would trust? <laughs> I think, you know, I feel like I'm in a different culture here, and I think Americans tend to be a lot more trusting of our, um, uh, our service providers. Uh, we're, we're less um, uh, privacy concerned. Um, so, that reflects my, my uh, coming from the States. Um, but I do think that many, many, many of these services will be reimagined as I select slices of my personal data and are those things are accessed in real time with control and that I've decided um, are appropriate. So I think in living service worlds, people will be leveraging the resources we provide in the um, like never before, anywhere via sensor data and more natural interfaces. Their intent will matter. 
Searle calls them complex and fully empowered actors. They will be in control, and everything will be reimagined to respond. Um, they'll, uh, this goes back to my original question. How will services know what you intend? I think that they'll know what you intend because you've designed them. They are you. Providers are <coughs> first based on the quality of resources that they provide. So that makes our job even harder. We have to work really carefully with service providers to make sure that the things that they're delivering from a, um, a service resource perspective are the things that will resonate. And that requires a whole host of things that we know how to do as service designers. Everything from going out and doing immersive and ethnographic research through doing detailed service um, blueprints and developing really wonderful service models. You know, Lushko talks a lot about how if you do have these brands collaborating, the sort of integration and sort of um, uh, mapping of the different service models that they have is going to be really one of the big challenges. But there's a huge opportunity there if we can start to get them to work together now.